One, two, one, two.
Yes, welcome. Yeah, I think they're all. On the plus side, I can leave this in the back of the room. No problem, yeah. It is actually. Yeah. It's on top floor. Yeah, it's
Do you know Siamma Shan Dusty? Siamma? Siamma Kyaf. Siamma Hayash. I don't remember his middle name, but Shan Dusty. He was an Eagles when I was at York. He's studying crypto stuff. Oh, he's okay. So is he in university? Yeah. Okay, yeah, he was. Uh, so he, he's from Iran as well, although he did his education in uh, Australia. Oh, that's good. He's a close friend. <laughs> So you, how long have you been in? Uh, in the UK for ten years. Okay. So I, I did my MSc in uh, Greenwich, uh -huh. and then uh, Northern Ireland for my uh -huh. PhD, and uh -huh. then uh, Scotland for my work. Northern Ireland is that Queen, so. Uh, Ulster. Ulster, okay. Ulster, Ulster, uh -huh. Ulster. Yeah. So oh, there we are. Okay. So, well, Settled down in Scotland. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that's uh, from South East. So Greenwich was in Medway, was it? In London. In London. Oh, okay. Uh, because there's a campus in Medway, which is yeah, yeah, part of the University of Kent as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah there are two, three campuses. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're in uh, Greenwich Park. Uh, okay, so that's. So you the Maritime. Ah, uh, yes. So, okay. So, yeah, that's so, you, so you move from there to Ulster? Yes. Now from here. From here. So, how long have you been in here? I've uh, been here since 2016. But okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I used to work in Aberdeen. Okay. So I, I went to Aberdeen first, uh, and then I came here. Hello. Hello. Cool. Why, Lily? I guess so. <laughs> Uh, I just happened to be here because partly uh, I need to give a talk, which is rescheduled from the last to the first. The so first speaker is not here yet. Uh, I think the first speaker is you. Ah, well, yeah. the original first speaker is late. Yeah, the, the, the original one is so late. which one are you? I'm, I'm number six on that list. Number six, yeah. Okay. Oh. I don't know if uh, you prefer to come back later for that number one. Uh, Uh, yes, the slide, I put it up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I think they're just. Yeah. And, uh, this one is working. Is that well. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Working. So that's the lights? Yeah, just. Um, yeah. Is that the lights? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 
Yeah. So. So okay. So you can, if you don't mind, you can have a. Thank you. One, two, three, one, two, three. It's mute. Uh, you're gonna stream it. Yeah. You have a cybersecurity revolution. One, two, three. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to do the cybersecurity revolution. So, it's gonna be 24 hours of a constant like a presentation all around the world, starting from here goes to Canada and then Israel and some other countries and then go, goes back to Edinburgh. So it's going to be 24 hours. So, and they call it, yeah. One, two, three. Hmm, I don't know, is it working, not working? One, two, three. One. Oh, I just, I don't think so it's working. I think they should be, they said that they're going to be here for the streaming, so I just leave that bit. Okay, so. Um, if, if they actually it's up to the organizer, I, I don't mind having a slice of If uh, you can make the slides available for everyone, we're going to have those plates. The slides, the slides, are you going to make them available for people to download? I don't mind. I mean, we are just about the <laughs> plates. My name is Nagme Moraspur. I'm a lecturer in cybersecurity and network at Edinburgh Napier University and one of the organizers for CSDF 2018. And so, as you can see, we have six talks today. So, we are starting with the last one because the, our first uh, guest speaker actually uh, he missed his flight. So, he will be attending, he will be joining us at the end of the uh, presentation. So, we have a uh, two guest lecture, um, uh, number one and number six. The rest are our research assistant and research students. So what I want you to do, guys, there's a paper in front of you uh, because you want to vote for the best presentation. So I would like you to vote for the best one uh, from number two to number five. So whichever you think is the best one, so please mark it and at the end of, at the, end of the session, uh, we will give the small prizes to each of them. Um, so I guess we're good, good to go, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Woody Arif. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in the School of Computing at the University of Kent, England. He's affiliated with the Kent uh, Interdisciplinary Research Center in Cybersecurity, and his research interests are in cyber, cyber, cyber crime, the cyber uh, security and dependability of uh, computer based systems, uh, cybersecurity education, and the Internet of Things with a strong, uh, uh, strong background uh, of interdisciplinary research. So I would like to yeah, invite him to the... Sorry for keeping a mouthful uh, blur of what I was doing. <laughs> no, just keep, keep it blur. Anyway, let's see if that uh, makes some sense on what we have here. Okay, thank you for inviting me to give a talk here today. So, um, as I've already mentioned, my main interest is in cybercrime. And also I'm looking into the human aspect of cybersecurity. So this is important these days because everything is human element. It's important to make sure that we don't forget that at the end of the day, 
some of the protests inside might be used by people. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. This is uh, in general. Um, so this talk is actually based on a paper that was presented in January at the uh, Embedded Wireless System and Networks uh, Conference in, in Madrid, or near Madrid. Uh, it was based on one of my, my students' uh, project, my student, uh, Jack. Is this it? Yeah, Jack McBride. He was one, one of my MSC students. And I uh, did it with uh, collaboration with another colleague, Julio, who was a professor at the University of Kent. Well, let's give a, a bit of background. Everyone here probably knows what you now think, so I'll probably will escape through this and go through it a bit quickly. Um, we've seen various images of what depicts it and now things, but the most common thing is uh, you have the connection uh, major of this, you have sensors. Ah, uh, no. Uh, it didn't work. You would hear it, but you would. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, it could be turned on or something. Oh, you okay. managed to turn it on? Okay, sorry. Let's Say for that. We're streaming it. And yeah, sorry. One, so it won't. Oh, it's going to go. Yeah. Oh. Oh, we should just put it somewhere. Yeah. There you go. Just clip it somewhere. Do you want to test? Does yeah. it work? Yeah, you won't hear it. Ah, everybody else. Everyone else. Okay. Shall I start from the beginning again? <laughs> no, I think that's fine. No, I was just going to continue where, where I left it off. So, Internet of Things, uh, various devices. You have things like doors. Uh, you can now open it with your phones. You have various Fitbit devices for health monitoring. Or, or, or this is actually some criminals trying to use drone to attack uh, various uh, Internet of Things uh, kits. Um, in general, it's meant to be there to help you. It's meant to make your life easier. It's meant to help in terms of automation. Uh, but there are always potential issues. And let's look at some examples. Um, it's everywhere. We have, you, I mentioned Fitbit. Uh, I also put a picture of a smart lock here. This is one of the, another research I did was breaking into security of IoT smart locks by using either brute force or trying to see what kind of uh, human biases in choosing override mechanism for smart locks could be. This thing doesn't come out quite well, but it's electronic toothbrush. So these are examples of some of the IoT devices that tend to be paired up to a smartphone. Smartphones tend to be the hub for all of the IoT uh, kits. But there are other things, uh, you see these uh, becoming more popular, like uh, Amazon uh, Echo, Alexa, um, vacuum cleaner that is connected to the internet, uh, smart light bulbs, uh, Nest uh, temperature control for, for the home, and even home security kits. So it includes cameras, sensors for the doors, um, maybe some motion detectors, all, all sorts of things that are connected together. Now, there's been a lot of uh, horror stories. Actually, last week, there was a, or two weeks ago, there was a, an incident or an article of someone in the US was well, accidentally, Alexa was sending a message of their conversation, private conversation, to a semi-stranger. <laughs> so someone who uh, worked for her hus the husband, I think, uh, the, I don't know how they, uh, the system got into that. Apparently, the explanation that uh, Amazon gave was that um, Alexa thought uh, there was a command to send a message to this person through email uh, or something. And, and, and there was some interaction somehow with the human as if they were confirming, yeah, I want to send this message to this uh, person. Anyway, um, you also see it's a lot in the news these days with uh, smart vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles, internet of connected vehicles. There were several high uh, cases of uh, vehicles, Chrysler being hacked or people managed to get in. In the morning there were talk about uh, people coming in through the entertainment system so that because that's one often the weakest uh, spots um, and then uh, abuse a well kind of break or take control of the car. Uh, but there are also other things like uh, smaller devices like uh, the Arduino up there, uh, Texas Instrument Kits and uh, Embed Device. Um, these are less kind of um, uh, ready to market, but it's used for various research purposes, for education, for learning of Internet of Things. In fact, we use this embed platform for teaching IoT in, uh, in our uh, final year module in University of Kent. So these devices often have the characteristics of uh, constrained power, constrained bandwidth. Um, so maybe some of the application for securing it, uh, that securing a system that would work in PCs or computers may not quite work easily on uh, these devices. So there are different approaches that needs to be considered. As uh, the theme of the whole uh, 
conferences about big data. I thought I mentioned a little bit about big data. Um, IoT success uh, rely a lot on the abundance of data. With IoT devices, you have sensors, you have uh, various ways of gathering data about the user. So this could be a, you know, location, uh, it could be how many steps you walk, it could all sorts of things. So these are all valuable, and even the metadata, how, many, how long a person uses the Fitbit, for example, they're all very useful. Um, but sometimes they could be misused or abused by the company who collect the data. Um, but there's an increase of user awareness about the, the, the data. There's been horror stories of TVs recording private conversations, or even like Alexa, or cars being hi hi uh, hijacked. Um, and there's also an idea of being able to generate values of your data. Maybe it's moving towards that economy where if you supply data, you might actually get some, something back in return. Okay, at the moment, what you get in, back in return is uh, the services that, say, Facebook or Google provide by sharing your data with them. Um, so it's still a challenge of how to pass control back of uh, data to the user. Now, um, there was some also a big story uh, in 2016 of the Mirai botnet. Security is becoming much more important because often IoT devices were designed and developed and marketed first on the features without too much consideration on the security. They have to get into the market quickly. There's a niche market, so they want to get in quickly. So often they overlook the security. Um, now, with the case of Mirai botnet, there were um, some devices, like hundreds of thousands of them, that could be somehow controlled uh, remotely by the attacker. Uh, these include cameras, uh, some uh, DVR, digital video recorders, and also some routers, uh, actually that's another camera, um, that could be taken over by the attacker and then used for m mounting, mounting a distributed denial of surface attack, and that killed uh, OVH in 2016, and it actually killed another big important player, was DIN, as a DNS surf, a surface in the US. Has a consequence, killed off several other surfaces like uh, Spotify, uh, and I think Twitter as well for, for a few hours. So, what happened? Here, the case was a classic blunder in security. Um, these devices, uh, some cameras, were running telnet ports, and they had default passwords uh, hardwired into uh, the system so that once people know that for roots for this particular device, you just need that password, you can just run it. <laughs> you can just get in remotely to, uh, to the targets and then control it. And um, once you do that, you can actually start looking or using this new army of uh, bots to spread. So by not securing your own device, you actually contribute to the insecurity of the whole system. So it's, it's very, very important to make sure that IoT devices are secure. Okay, so that's a, well, I'm, I'm sure I'm uh, preaching to the converted here. We, we know that security is important. Um, but how do we try to do this? What can we do? So let's have a look at the approach that we have. So this work uh, was based on a collaboration uh, between us at the University of Kent and uh, some colleagues at the University of Bristol. So we, we took a red-blue approach team. Um, we want to focus on the underlying uh, system, which is the operating system, of IoT devices. There are many operating systems out there that could be used for IoT. The one in particular we use here is called Contiki. I'll talk a little bit more in the next uh, few slides. Uh, there are a few others like Riot, uh, Embed, uh, Google has their own as well. Um, so we took a red team approach, so Kent, uh, University of Kent, we, we want to use, uh, static we use static analysis tools to find bugs. There are, in software engineering and uh, system uh, programming languages research, uh, static analysis tools are very valuable tools to find uh, potential vulnerabilities, bugs in the system. There's no way that you can get you know, perfect software all the time unless it's very, very simple. So that's why we try to find it um, uh, using uh, static analysis. Uh, in the meantime, our colleagues in Bristol, actually one of them were part of the contributor to the Contiki operating system. So this means he, as part of the team, could uh, re uh, verify that the bugs we found. Um, actually, one of the challenges of the static analysis tools is that there are a lot of false positives. So. <laughs> Uh, we cannot just 
trust everything actually broken because otherwise you'd be scared you're not going to run anything <laughs> because it will flag a lot of things that are being potentially uh, dangerous but uh, that's not the case so sometimes it's just a simple issue of like oh uh, if you're a developer you can see ah okay that's what it does okay actually it's fine so so that's why we need to have someone with very much um, built in um, knowledge of the system to actually verify this and then has the ability to, ver uh, to fix it and check it back into the distribution. Um, so, well, they could do it themselves, I suppose, but having someone else with fresh pair of eyes hopefully will help to uh, open up uh, potential issues uh, better. So, for the, so any, any question up to this point or comments, I'm happy to take any questions in the meantime if there's any. Um, okay, so the rest of the talk, I'm going to look a bit more deeper into what we actually did in this. Uh, I'm not going to talk into too much detail. If you're interested, there's a paper out there, there's a PDF that you can download as well, so there's more, more in there. And if you're interested even more, I <laughs> have the source code and all sorts of things that my student did, but I'm, I'm sure he would be fine to share some of it uh, if you want to learn more. Okay. So what is Contiki? Contiki is uh, an open source um, operating system that was used for uh, uh, constraint devices. Uh, so the, uh, these are mostly on uh, platforms like uh, Texas Instruments, uh, the one I showed earlier. Um, or um, it could actually be used for other uh, consumer product, product, uh, products these days, like in LifeX, uh, the light bulb, the smart light bulb. Uh, and I think there's a ThingSquare uh, product that's using that as well. So it's a uh, very constrained. There's not a lot of power in there. There's uh, bandwidth uh, for net network is pretty uh, limited as well, um, and slow power. Uh, it abuses a proto, proto thread programming model, which means that uh, you can do multi-threading and you can use uh, event event-driven programming, and it's got supports for various platforms. Um, it's a bit of timeline. It started in 2001 uh, with Adam Dunkel's. Um, in six, in I think in Sweden, Stockholm, developed this uh, open source pla pla platform stack for embedded devices, and from there, it moved on to a bit more um, uh, platforms, various uh, 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 Commodore 64, NES, etc. Um, and it snowballed; it got a lot more interest and uh, various improvement. There's various um, uh, people contributing because it made it's made open source, so various people can contribute and take parts in development. Um, and then uh, it is, uh, the latest version that we saw was Contiki 3, that was released in 2015, um, added more supports for various platforms. Um, and as far as I know, it hasn't been quite closely maintained since then, but there is a, a spin-off as, as a fork of that, which is called Contiki NG. Uh, that was uh, released, uh, I think, November last year. Um, so. There's a bit of a timeline, there's a bit of a history of the Contiki, and uh, I think it's, yeah, it's a nice operating system. Um, oh yeah, I already mentioned this, uh, latest versions uh, from August 2015. It has this following directory structure. Uh, it's got specific directories to deal with CPU, dealing with chipsets, etc. Uh, various supports for, from uh, platforms that uh, will use uh, uh, Contiki. And there are some examples that can be used for applications that people might want to develop themselves for, for their own uh, setup and, you know, other directories. Um, and the, there are some issues with the mainstream Contiki. That's why um, a group of the core developers decided to, okay, improve it on, on uh, for example, streamlining some of the platform supported and removing some of the redundant code, which could potentially be the source of vulnerability. You know, uh, if you have extra piece of code that you don't know very well or you don't maintain it very well, then it could actually be opened up uh, a door for attack. So they did a, a fork of uh, Contiki N Next Generation, Contiki NG. So there's a website there if you're interested to find out more. Now, what did we do here? So we, we tried to look at the Contiki operating system as a, as a platform, as a case study that uh, we can systematically, method, uh, met methodically look into uh, 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 its characteristic and its, uh, its behavior. So we look at the metrics, um, lines of codes, etc., uh, architecture, uh, and then using the static analysis tools to see if there is any potential vulnerability that we could 
uh, actually exploit. Among others, some of the interests that we uh, look at in the static analysis was the source lines of code, how many lines, because sometimes the more line of code you have, the more complex it becomes, the more likely there might be uh, some bugs in there. So it looks at some errors and bug density and there's a specific look at some functions that could be considered unsafe, so copying memories, etc. Um, so we use uh, several tools because uh, there is no silver bullet. Uh, you cannot just rely on one tool because each tool has its uh, strong points and uh, some deficiencies as well. So we look at two commercial tools called CodeSonar and Understand. Um, but we focus more later on using some of the open source tools, uh, uh, in particular CPP check, flow finders, and rats. Okay. I'm not an expert in this. Actually, David's probably more uh, suitable to talk about this. Uh, so, uh, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, but uh, the investigation was based on mostly on these uh, three uh, tools. So what have we got? Um, so if we look at the code base size from earlier version, from the earliest version, version two, you can see that there's a marked trend that the number of lines of code just goes up. It's just increasing. There's a lot more features to be added. There were also a lot more platforms to be supported. Hence, it just grows naturally. You expect that. You can see that's uh, way, another way of looking at it, so the graph of how, um, how the line of code has gone up. Um, if we look at the last f version, uh, version 3, there are various languages, uh, programming languages, used in uh, implementing parts of the uh, Contiki. So uh, C was the main language, language uh, com composing of uh, about 355,000 or 56,000 lines of code. So that's a bulk of it. But there are other supports for various different uh, languages, mostly in examples and, and, and other non-core parts of the uh, code. Um, if you look at the number of errors detected um, using three tools, uh, Flow Finder, RAT, and CPP Check, um, you can see that there's also, because there's more line of code, there's also increase of number of errors there. Well, naturally, you, you kind of expect that. It's, it's uh, the more space to, to, to explore and the more potential errors there. Um, but one thing that is quite interesting in that, even though the number of lines increases, the number of uh, bug increases, the bug density is actually decreasing uh, in terms of the number of bugs per line of code, it's actually going down. So one might assume that actually they've learned from the mistakes in previous version and improve it and it becomes uh, more, uh, in a sense, in fraction, it's actually better, more secure in terms of number of bugs. Okay. Um, okay. So you can see yeah, it's, it's going down. Um, it's quite remarkable. Well, it's not remar massively different, but it's still a, a marked uh, a redu reduction on the number of, uh, of bug density. Okay. Um, another thing that's quite interesting to look at um, in terms of what kind of uh, distribution is, uh, is a bug is looking at the various directories that, uh, or various uh, parts of the, the code that was used for, uh, for Contiki. So most of the, uh, or the highest bug density was actually found in the tools directory and the apps directory and, and the examples. Uh, the core directory itself is reasonably decent. Um, well, okay, there's not much in doc, documentation code uh, of the code, so a library uh, seems to be pretty, uh, pretty safe from uh, bugs. Um, if we look at uh, potential use of unsafe functions, so these include uh, using puts, gets, various C commands that if you not use it carefully, it might cause issues uh, like buffer overflow or whatever. Uh, it's possible to copy memories to a place that it's not supposed to be and then there's a leak of uh, information. Um, there were some of the interesting ones, for example, uh, memory copy here is, it's, uh, it seems to be quite a lot of usage of them. But it turns out, so this is a bit that uh, is useful to have someone in the system uh, who's, who knows the system well is to check with them, like, what's going on here? There seems to be a lot of potential unsafe use of uh, the function here, but he said, oh, I, I know what that does. 
it actually is fine. So they, they actually look into it. Yeah, that's, that's actually not causing any issue. So those are some false positives that we still need to figure out how to actually learn it better next time. So one of the aspects that we could uh, think in the future is how we can create a more intelligent way of doing this, not just by using um, the static analysis tools and taking the result as gospel value, but maybe use machine learning even to see how uh, things have been confirmed by the human and then say, okay, that's not an issue, uh, and somehow feed it as a training data for future uh, similar features. So um, anyway, so yeah, it, it seems like uh, there's a lot more unsafe functions, but some of them turn out to be fine harmless. Um, nevertheless, as part of the uh, investigation, we, we managed to find two CV, uh, common vulnerability expo exposure, and we disclosed them. Um, so some of them are pretty simple. This one is, uh, uh, where is it, an issue, uh, da, 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 and it's using uh, an element on ACCPD, uh, the daemon for the uh, web. Uh, for a particular platform. So the impact may be not as massive, but nevertheless, there is still uh, an issue that needs to be uh, looked at. Okay. Um, and there's another one, I think, uh, on MQ um, using some uh, potential cross-scripting uh, uh, script, uh, cross vulnerability using uh, Mosquito MQTT uh, uh, protocol uh, for, uh, for that. Um, if I remember correctly, there might actually be a video to show how it was possible to actually do the, uh, 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 I think it's a kind of uh, injection, uh, script injection in, in this um, uh, code, uh, in this uh, platform. So what happened was um, they didn't sanitize or they didn't check carefully what is entered in the input. So it's possible to add some trailing commands in this case in JavaScript, if I remember correctly, so that you could actually run something else that you're not supposed to, to run. Um, let's see if it does play. Uh, it's probably a bit small print, uh, small uh, screen as well, but we'll ha let's see if it shows something. Yeah, so, so the student here entered, it's gone too quick. Uh, how do I pause this? I can't even pause it. Uh, so the bit here, there's a, an addition trailing after the value that you need to enter on the form with some JavaScript just to alert one. So basically pop up with a one in the window. Um, in a sense, you could, well, potentially do other commands. Uh, so if you run it again, uh, by entering that as part of field that you need to uh, enter, um, you can actually, ah, that doesn't come up very well. So basically here, it was a pop-up saying that the, uh, yeah, so the alert of one actually pop up on the, on the browser. So it's, it's a, yeah, it's a simple enough uh, script to do, but uh, nevertheless, it has to be looked at. And using the approach we did, we somehow managed to, to find that. Okay. Um, so it's just a bit of a taste, uh, taster of what uh, things we, we did on that. Um, just to summarize, what we did was to, to use several static analysis tools to find some potential issues, some potential vulnerabilities that might uh, exist within Contiki uh, operating system for IoT. Uh, we managed to discover uh, two uh, vulnerabilities that were uh, identified as SCVs. They've been fetched, so we, we let them know. Uh, the, it's lucky to, well, it's nice to have a, a developer on, on the platform linked to us closely so that they could actually act on it very quickly to fix it. So that's been patched. Um, in a sense, this was a pilot study. We, we did it as a part of a small grant from a certain funding agency that shall remain nameless. Um, and um, we, we used to see if the red blue approach could actually be useful. I think there's some use in that. It's not quite perfect. We have to augment it with other approaches, obviously, but it still it has some value that could uh, contribute to that. Um, so where do we go from here? So there are several things that we want to move on to, um, including investigating other IoT operating, uh, operating systems. It's not just Contiki, there are a few others out there. Um, but 
another thing that we want to uh, develop is a more uh, methodical framework for examining uh, the security of IoT software in general. This is ranging from opening system up um, and applying various other techniques, including machine learning, how to, uh, for example, uh, be able to learn better and make it more uh, effective in terms of alerting where the potential bugs are or issues are, um, to all sorts of things like protection. What kind of IoT protection can actually be uh, developed because of the constraints that IoT devices have we cannot just translate everything that we have on a uh, normal pla or computer platform, uh, for example, intrusion detection system or, um, uh, or antivirus, that kind of thing will probably not run as, if, or encryption will not be running as efficiently on IoT devices, but instead, where can we find a sweet spot so that we can have something that is uh, functional on, on IoT devices yet delivers a uh, secure, uh, more secure um, platform? Um, Oh, well, I'll just end up with that. So where do we go from there? Well, uh, another piece of research that I'm doing is actually a ransomware. So the talk in the mor the, this morning from T Trend Micro about ransomware increase is wanna cry and the insight from there is very fascinating and I actually enjoy that and I agree with uh, what he, he was talking about. Um, but with IoT becoming more prevalent in our life, there's a possibility that you could have ransomed IoT devices. Um, one of my PhD students currently working at uh, ways of um, making IoT devices taken hostage. So, for example, routers. Let's start with the router. It's quite straightforward. You, you can then block the victim's uh, access unless they pay. It's very straightforward. Uh, but it's just a proof of concept for now. Um, but it could go to other things. For example, a printer. You could just make the printer burn, uh, because, well, maybe not literally burn, but waste the toner and things, or uh, cars, if you don't pay now, your brake will not work while you're driving in a motorway, you probably have to pay pretty quickly, um, and various other devices that you can perhaps at the moment just dream of, but uh, yeah, it's, it's quite exciting, but scary at the same time. So I have to acknowledge some of our colleagues here, especially George uh, Ikonomu, who's uh, who's a lecturer at the University of Bristol. He's one of the contributors of Contiki. So he knows the work on Contiki inside out. So uh, if you want to know more about Contiki, uh, either drop me a line, I can pass you, uh, the detail of George to you, and then you can get in touch with him. Uh, and also he had some, a couple of students there, Alex Pop and Alex Stanoff, who helped with that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So we move. If you have any question, David? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I really like the work and uh, oh, the thank you. red blue team approach sounds fun. Did you think about, so I guess the two CVEs that you reported, mm -hmm. you, um, the, uh, the person who found the problems then had to generate the exploits manually. Yeah. Did you look at um, automating like it? To, yeah. that would, that's a good point. That is uh, something that we could. Uh, with help of machine learning and others, actually try to explore how we can actually automate the attack. Mm. Um, we haven't got that far. <laughs> at the moment, it was uh, because it was an internship project at the same time, and uh, it was just done over the summer. It was more labor intensive in terms of people had. It, dis it does take a long time for uh, the static analysis. That's, um, if we can automate that, that will be more uh, efficient, hopefully. But it's, yeah, still. I think that's probably future work. Yes, thank you. Any, Any other? I have one question for you. Actually. Sure. Thank you. So, um, uh, I know some of my students actually they use the mm -hmm. uh, with Kuja. So yes. As the operating system and mm -hmm. Kuja simulator. Simulator, yeah. So, have you done any like, uh, security analysis of Kuja? We haven't, no. We, we look at the Contiki itself. We didn't look at the Kuja. But, Kuja uh, or maybe when, uh, have you looked at the uh, Contiki when the Kuja is running? Because you said that the, the, in terms of vulnerability, the it's, yeah, um, we haven't done that, but I think it would be a valuable aspect to look into. Uh, also, we want to look at the new Contiki, the Contiki NG, which is uh, the one that's uh, meant to be more secure, that's marketed as more secure. Uh, and also, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, I think they, they do tighter coding in that, and they have smaller team on that, and they have a lot of experience from previous Contiki versions. Um, so that's, again, future work that uh, we would like to explore. Thank you for, Thank you for that, yes. Okay.
Thank you. Sure. Do you need this? Okay, guys, we have Mr. Andres Robres from Edinburgh Napier University, a supervised energy monitoring based machine learning approach for anomaly detection in a clean water supply system. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. As Naomi introduced me, I'm one of the research students at Napier University. Uh, now we are working in a project related with industrial control systems and cybersecurity. So I'm delighted to present one of the outputs of this research, which englobes a, su a supervised a machine learning approach a monitoring the energy consumption of devices from the industrial control system. So we will talk about a little bit of introduction, just to have a little bit of knowledge about industrial control systems. Uh, the literature review, uh, the proposed research, the practical work conducted so far, the findings, and conclusions and future work. So, industrial control systems. Industrial control systems are everywhere. We could find in industries like transportation, uh, oil, uh, even automotive, some of the newest cars have some components that work with control system. We can have even an, in nuclear power plants and all of these industries. <coughs> At the beginning, back in the days, the industrial control systems were not supposed to be connected to any network. So they were created with no security in mind because they were supposed to be isolated systems. But now, with the development of the technology, these devices now face the internet. They are connected now to the internet so they become in an easy prey for attackers. Well, it can be seen here clearly, but uh, the attacks against industrial control systems incremented over the years. There is a huge outbreak from 2010 onwards, because in 2010, uh, 2010 a big attack happened against an Iranian nuclear facility. It was the Stugnet attack who break into the, this nuclear plant and destroy some of the components that belong to the, to the system. Furthermore, we have more attacks against these systems because, as I mentioned before, they face now the internet, so they are vulnerable to attacks like buffer overflow, SQL injection, and so on. So we could classify these attacks as, as common attacks because these attacks are faced by corporate networks and control networks. But we have more harmful and specific attacks. As I mentioned, Stugnet and Black Energy as well was one of the biggest attacks against an Ukrainian power facility. During the winter, the, attack, the attackers choose destroy, not destroy, but they disrupt into this power plant and they disconnected. So a lot of families were without electricity during the winter for six hours. And we have also other type of attacks aiming to extract sensitive information. Two examples are Duku and Habex. Both attacks choose look for informa information about the control system, like some diagrams of information that could be used to perform harmful attacks. Also in 2017, we had two big attacks the WannaCry and Petya, I know that you should be here about it. Uh, the WannaCry disrupt three automotive industries like Renault, Nissan, and Honda. They stopped the operations for about one hour because the, the components uh, got, uh, got infected with this malware. Also with Petya, some industries like pharmaceutical stopped their operation because 
the, the components were compromised as well. So as we can see, we still are vulnerable to these type of attacks, even in control systems. And tools like this, I don't know if you have heard about it, Shodan, they provide a lot of information related to control systems. They, there is like a, a Google, which tells you, for example, which devices like Siemens or Modbus, different protocols are connected over the internet. So if we were an attacker, we have really, really good information here about the systems. So how we, how we narrow it down this research? First of all, we made a good research about industrial control systems. Then we classify the attacks. We classify between common attacks and target attacks. We are more focused on this type of target attacks like Stugnex because nowadays we have solutions like Farwars, IDSs, dealing with common attacks. The major approach for detecting these type of attacks are IDSs, IPSs. Some of the approaches use energy based and some of them, just a few of them, offer a response against these attacks because, of course, dealing with false alarms is the more scary thing here. Inside the IDSs and IPSs, we have another classification. We have signature based, anomaly based, some using probabilistic approach, and some tailored depending on the system. In energy base, we have some solutions measuring the energy consumption into the PLC CPU and the PLC rails. And just few of them offer response to IDS, based it in control techniques, and some of them are rule-based. So we focus on machine learning because it's one of the biggest approaches taken so far. And it has a lot of approaches like supervised, unsupervised, and semi-supervised. This is our proposed research. We simulated a clean water supply system using a Festo rig. We are using here real equipment like the PLC Siemens 1500, and we are also using a supervisory console for simulating a SCADA system. We connect current sensors to the pump and the proportional, uh, sorry, the solenoid valve of this system in order to collect the energy traces during the normal operation. And we also collect the traces under attack. We execute the attacks over the network. The first attack that we execute is modifying the set point of one of the tanks, because this system is supposed to simulate the water supply from a small town. Here you have the findings regarding the energy consumption of the devices. These are the traces under normal operation and under attack. The red, the red parallel lines represent each one of the attacks performed against the systems. We can see at the beginning the energy pattern is really stable. We could tell that it's working properly. But when we execute the attack, we can see that the energy consumption of the pump just start to be less or it start to be not the normal pattern that it used to be. Out of this, we collect the information from the sensors. The sensors offer four features. So we have four features for each sensor. We connect two sensors, so we have eight features. We use the supervised machine learning, so we have to manipulate the data. The data. We have to apply some techniques like normalization, just to, for each one of the algorithms. And we divide the data between training de data and testing data. But these are, these are the results. We use the Weka software to run three machine learning algorithms doing a classification task. We evaluate in order the accuracy, precision, and recall. Here we are using the accuracy to test each one of the algorithms. And also we use the F measure feature, which is a weighted, uh, it is a weighted balance between the precision and the recall. We are using a statistical significance to evaluate each one of the algorithms. Normally, the statistical significance tells that 
if you have a difference of 5% between each algorithm, you can tell that one is better than other. But this value could vary depending on the system. So as this is a critical system, we reduce that statistical significance to 3%. This is a summary of the findings. We found out that random forests perform the best over the other algorithms. Of course, we play with each one of the features of the algorithms. For example, in KNN, we play with the K value and SVM with the, each one of the kernels. And in random forests, we play with each one of the leaves. Uh, regarding to time taking to build the model, we can see that SVM takes a lot more than each one of the other algorithms, and it doesn't perform good compared with the other algorithms. Uh, whereas KNN is the one that performed the best regarding to time. Well, as a conclusion, uh, we developed a SCADA system. Our research is different than the ones now in the academia because we are using actually real devices. We are not simulating any data. We are collecting the data from real devices, so that's why we are building the model based on this data, which made this research different than others. Uh, the results also show that it is possible to detect attacks using the energy consumption approach and using machine learning to classify the data. Uh, the results also show us that random forests perform better than the other algorithms with shorter and large data sets. For future work, we would like to implement this concept in a more realistic environment. That's why we plan to improve our testbed, make it more realistic to a real water supply system. Even we are thinking in implementing the water treatment process, if possible and collect more data. We, we saw that the more data, the better performance of the algorithm. So we plan to wire more current sensors into these systems. And we also are, are planning to explore into unsupervised machine learning approach in order to compare both of them. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, yes, yes. On, on case one, we collect the data from just one sensor uh, during one second. In case two, we collect the data from two sensors each second, but we realize that we have changes in the energy in less than one second. So we collect in the case three, we collect the data each 10 milliseconds. So we have more data in case three. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and we also perform future classification over the data. I forgot to mention that, and we get rid of some of the features. So I, I guess the technique is going to detect anomalies in general. Yes. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing specific to cyber attacks. Yes. Is, is that right? So I, I was just wondering if um, the water companies already have such kind of monitoring systems and look for anomalies when they... Uh, you, know, you need to go with demand, so there might be reasons for the yeah. pairing and the time. Is there something particular about a cyber attack that would lead to a different, um, different kind of uh, yes. pattern? Yes, exactly. That's why we are planning in the, our next uh, approach, like to uh, more specific attacks, not just changing the water uh, set point, more specific demands, and see how the system behaves regarding to type of attacks and see if we could use machine learning to even classify the type of attack and realize where really is happening the attack. In, if it's happening if one sensor, if it's happening in the, in the pump or in any device of the, of the system. I mean, it's a very nice application area. Have, and have, have there been example attacks where you could get any real data or you don't know as such? Uh, no. I mean, no. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's why we are implementing this system because we want to collect the data. But 
the difference is that we are not looking into the network traffic. Understood. We are getting the data from directly from the endpoints because we cannot rely on the information that the PLC provides us because it has been proved that the PLC could be hacked and could provide different information. That's why this system is independent from the PLC. It's like an external mm -hmm. implementation. Because of that, you spot other kinds of anomalies as well. So it might be yes. factory failure. Exactly. Like yeah, it could be a sensor failure, for example. Yes. Just out of curiosity, why you pick water system instead of, say, Yeah, because just because power might be some incidents that you could compare against real life incidents. Well, there are some as well, but yes, yes. But we would like this approach because we could hands-on in this project. We could implement even the control system because we are also exploring some techniques to detect the attacks using control engineering techniques, and we also plan to to respond against the attack. We want to propose a mechanism or response to attack. So if your system is under attack, we could minimize the impact of the attack using control techniques. That's what we want to do. And we have all the equipment ready to do ah, that. So you yes. have the kits that yes. you're supposed to have. <laughs> okay. um, how much data did you have? How did you treat your algorithms? Well, it's about 2,000 reg registers. Okay. Yeah, but now we collected a bigger data set. So yes, because the behavior, um, if you go back to the other slide, um, the behavior is, um, for the time, I think is quite atypical because usually when, when you get large amounts of data, the nearest neighbor approach can to scale very badly with um, large data sets. And so, so it's quite surprising that the uh, support vector machines take that much longer yes. on your data sets. Yes. Um, yeah, so just, um, I guess a suggestion, if, you, if you're looking at larger data sets, um, can your members have quite big problems coping with that? Exactly. We need to find out some optimizations into yeah. the data. Yes, yes, because... For, for support vector machines, they have quite good approximations to make them scale in there with the data. Yeah, but that's why it takes longer, I thought, because it needs to make all this partial calculus instead of KNN, for example, that you just measure the distance, which is made more simplistic. Yes, but um, then you need um, to measure the distance between each of your data points, and that if you, if you, if you have um, a million data points, um, yeah, your calculations um, are one million times one million. You can, you can look at all yeah. the distances. Yes, I'm afraid of that. Yes, I will figure it out in our later report. Thank you. Yes, yes, exactly. For example, if we have attacks like steel attacks that are really difficult to detect using the energy consumption, because for example, let's say the set point, we have a set point of six liters, and the attack starts reducing the set point by one we wouldn't be able to detect using the energy consumption on the pump only. But, for example, if we could measure the energy consumption in the ultrasonic sensor that measures the amount of water in one tank, we could use that to detect that type of attack, although the pump doesn't tell you anything. I believe that in your case, for example, the energy can be in any shape. For example, it can be in the shape of the movement. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Converting okay. anything. Hearing noises from the system, that can be energy as well. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, how about the sensors? You know, how you trust your sensors? You know, if not in terms of like a, them being uh, like a, uh, uh, abnormal, like a, if there like you know, something wrong happened to them and the reading that you get from them are not correct, you know, what would be your approach? You know, like in terms of energy consumption to detect that. Yes, we will have exactly. That's one of the things that we are working on now. So we will figure it out. Yes, but that's yes, it's a really good question. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you.
so you need to put uh, you need to use this one and put this one and you need to use this to introduce you okay so guys we have uh, Sean McEwen, so from Edinburgh Napier University, uh, Big Drive Forensics, faster processing using reduced file representation. Thank you very much. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to... Ah. It's working. I just want to keep it out of the way. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Sean McKeown, and this is actually uh, part of a, or it's the work for a paper that I've got submitted uh, for a conference that's a week and a half in Glasgow. So um, this is a nice sort of warm up for that as well. So uh, I'm dealing with the problem of uh, detecting contraband, which tends to be something the police do about 80% of the time, at least the digital forensics investigators do. And basically, the way this is done uh, as part of an investigation is that a cryptographic hash will be applied to every file on the device. So we've got an image over here. It could easily be a, a video or some other file type. Pass it through some hash function. That could be SHA-1, MD5. I've picked SHA-256 just because it's the, the smallest one that isn't broken currently. And you get a, a nice string, a hexadecimal string that says, OK, we've, we've got some identifier for this document. And these uh, are really difficult to map back, so you can't generate an image that would generate this very easily, that's the entire point. So you then have a database of, say, five million images, which is roughly what Police Scotland have, and you're processing your device. Every file gets passed through here, you get a string, you check in the database. If it is there, we've got a positive hit, and we found some stuff that shouldn't be there. So that's the entire sort of use case. So, one of the problems with this and this approach is that it's not helping get through the backlog. So digital investigators, the police in particular, are struggling to cope just with the sheer volumes that are being thrown at them. We talk a lot about big data in the cloud. Well, it exists in our homes as well. There's a growing number of devices per investigation. So if you think about 20 years ago, people might have had one PC in the house. That would be it. Today, in my household alone, we've got only two people living there. I've got um, probably two phones just to myself. Girlfriend's got one, there's a laptop, my laptop, PC, server, PlayStation, televisions. The number of devices is just inflated massively, as the capacities have as well. So drives, when forensics tools were being built, would be gigabytes, tens of gigabytes at best. Now we're talking multiple terabytes for a single disk. And this has resulted in up to 18 months of a backlog in Britain. That, well, that was 2015, so I imagine it's only worse now. And um, as of a paper published last year, uh, claiming four years in Ireland, which is pretty terrible. And the main issue with it is this, this bottleneck of trying to get the data off of the device. So think about this as being a four terabyte disk. The fastest we can get that off of there is about 133 megabytes a second, give or take, depending on the actual disk. Now that can take a very long time. In fact, 8.2 years if you work it out based on that. But if you're using a, a dedicated forensics tool, you're probably looking at another 20-30% time on top of that as well. So existing solutions in the literature really talk about what's called triage. So we're trying to cut down on what we have to process or at least prioritise it. So we've got a bunch of stuff um, from a warehouse or uh, a particular location and we were thinking, OK, is there anything of value here? So we can triage each device, have a quick look at it and say, OK, we should look at this one, or this one's probably OK, we can put that in the back of the pile. And one way to do this is to look back at this um, data trickle, as it were, and just process things as fast as this comes out. And that's achieved with lots of processing, essentially. Um, quite powerful processors, um, multiple thereof, and some kind of workstation or server configuration. And you can also do things like, at the bottom here, uh, with Garfunkel paper, uh, parse out GPS logs and emails and sort of get a little snippet of what's going on up front to make a decision quickly. But again, you're still limited by that data trickle. The other general approach is to say, OK, we've got four terabytes, potentially, but we don't need to look at all of that. Maybe if we just looked at a few gigabytes or tens of gigabytes or even hundreds of gigabytes, that'd be much better. So it's 
it's, it's about sampling the data on the device and seeing if we can determine anything from that. So one way is statistical block-based sampling. So we'll take you know, a sample of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of blocks on a device and hash each one of those blocks rather than whole files. And if any one of those blocks matches our database, then OK, we should take a, a good look at it. And the other method is to look at the file system. So you've got your NTFS partition. You can look at the metadata and say, OK, uh, based on historical records, uh, we've got this profile for what this kind of case looks like. And they've actually created them for different use cases like embezzlement, but I'm still talking about contraband detection. So we'll say, OK, we'll look in this directory, in this directory, in this directory, and that'll do. That'll give us a decent idea. So we were taking a slightly different approach, but still along the veins of, uh, in, in a similar vein, in data reduction. So as I said, the typical approach is to hash every file and all of the file. But one way of reducing the data we have to actually get off the device is to say, OK, but we're only really looking for a unique signature. So maybe we don't need to read the whole file. Maybe we can just get away with reading the end of the file. And I think it works out roughly 1% to 3% even on relatively small files. So you're only needing about 1%, 3% of the file. So you're reducing what you actually need to get off of the disk, what you're passing along the bus. And um, that N value at the end here, uh, we actually worked out as about 4K, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. And it was tested for two data sets, Flickr 1 million, which is actually a media retrieval data set that was just handy to have, of quite small JPEGs, only about 124 KB on the mean. And the GovDocs data set converted to PNG just to give slightly bigger file sizes. And that was, I think they were about 1.4 megabytes, and it's only about 100,000 images. I think this is a... Oh, there's a pop-up this way. Yeah, the window lost focus. There we go. Right, right so uh, the main thing about a signature is that it's unique. There's no point in having something that points at uh, a file and says, oh, one in 10,000 of the time there's a false positive because we're dealing with scale here. Because the whole point is that this are too big or there's too much data in the first place. So I can't even see it very well. But uh, basically reading from the start of the file, so if you take the first 4K, it works out as 97% unique on the JPEG data set and 99 point something percent, which sounds OK. But when you're dealing with a million images, that means about 30,000 false positives, which is pretty bad. But even if you read two-thirds of the mean JPEG in this data set, you're still only getting up to 99.97%. So, OK, that's, that's a bit better, but there's still too many false positives because of things like color profiles or shared quantization tables or Photoshop headers that have just been added in. And I think the worst case in my data set was about one and a half megabytes in is when the actual image started. The rest of it was just fluff at the start. Now, if you take... Uh, data from the end of the file, and 4K happens to be enough, you get um, a unique signature for both of these data sets. So that's 1.1 million images, and I did combine them as well to test it out, just with 4K of data from the end. And the reason for that is you're looking at a compressed data stream. So it's, it's all raw entropy, essentially, at the end of the file. And you can do things like read, read some more blocks, so take that 4K and make it 16K, or take 4K from the start of the file and then the end of the file. But as long as you've got this last 4K bit, it seems to work quite well. So there are a bunch of performance influences here. I've sort of labeled them from top to bottom. So uh, we'll start with drive size. So drive size is very important here because it's the difference between sequential and random 4K I.O. So when you're reading the whole file and you're doing it in, in the same order, you're getting that 133 megabytes I was talking about from the disk, theoretically, probably not actually in practice. But if you're taking small chunks of files that even if they're in sequential order, you're not getting the same throughput because the disk has to physically spin, the read head has to move to that track, and then the small actuator on the end actually has to move as well. And that's just because disks are so dense now. It's actually really difficult to pinpoint one particular sector. Whereas SSDs don't have that problem. So they've got much higher sequential throughput, but they also have much better random 4K. 
And the, the red number at the top, you can't see it because of the, the image now, but that's at 32 threads, and blue is single-threaded. And find that you're actually going to fall somewhere in between these two values for your, your realistic throughput when I was doing the experiments. But yeah, long story short, SSDs are much better at this kind of, um, this kind of data access. Uh, another really important thing is file size. So I've got a, a diagram for this, uh, which has turned out OK. Uh, full file hashing, re because it reads the whole file unexpectedly, uh, it scales linearly with the file size. So if I've got one kilobyte of data, it takes me a certain length of time. If I've got 10 megabytes, it takes me a proportional amount of time, because I have to read the whole thing. However, if you're just taking that last 4K, we don't care about how long the file is. It could be 100 megabytes, it could be a gigabyte. We only want that first 4K. So the time it takes doesn't scale with file size at all. And what that essentially means is the bigger the file, the bigger the differences in performance for these two approaches. So you can see a big massive gulf over here. Next down, file system was quite important in our experiments as well. And to understand this, I really have to frame it in terms of costs. So sequential reading is a certain cost, finding the block on the disk in the first place is a certain cost, and then actually extracting that and sending it across the data bus, whatever it is, SATA, M the M2, PCI Express bus. But file systems also have a cost. We don't really tend to think about them unless we're really um, entrenched in performance metrics. But it turns out that ext4 is just much better at this kind of access. And in fact, it was better sequentially as well. It just seems better overall. Um, but when you're looking up a file, if I say, okay, I've got some directory, I want this file. I have to say, okay, uh, let's look at the metadata, find out where these blocks are, or even find the first block and then traverse the whole list of blocks to find the last one. And actually send that request to the, the disk to spin and find it. And then, okay, we'll think about the next one. Uh, you can alleviate some of this by pre-processing and you're looking at the metadata up front and just creating a list of blocks at the start, so we don't actually have to interact with the file system thereafter. And in that case, you actually get slightly better than ext4 performance. So ext4 is actually really good, highly recommended. Not that you can actually impact this, so your device just might have to be NTF NTFS. But it was just to explore the different behavioral characteristics of the technique. And at the end, uh, number of threads. So for the experimental data, we tried more than one thread on a hard drive. It doesn't very, work very well. The idea being that you want to spin in one nice rotation through the entire disk, through all the sectors. As soon as you start giving jumbled requests, you'll jump to this part of the spiral, and then over here, and then back, and it just it, it messes up, and I don't think the disk queue works very well. Whereas an SSD can do it all in parallel. So I can say, oh, I want uh, block 42 and 76 and a billion. And it doesn't care where they are because of the way it sequentially accesses everything. And in fact, the more NAND flash you have on an SSD, generally the higher performance because it can do more things in parallel with more pieces of flash. So again, I can back into NT NTFS as well because that seems to top out about eight threads. It hits some kind of plateau. Whereas ext4, again, pretty good. Scales really well with the number of threads. So we can throw loads of requests at the device, um, which again, benefits more for an SSD. Is everyone following this so far? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's not turned out very well. Basically, we had um, big data set of one million small images on the left, hundred thousand uh, larger images on the right. Uh, the techniques in their different sizes. So I said like first and last, and you can read last, you can read last 4K, but also last 12K, last 16K. Uh, different file system and drive setups, so NTFS, ext4 with a hard drive and SSD, but we only did NTFS with the hard drive here. And uh, first thing to note, small files don't work out very well on hard disks, unsurprisingly, because there's, there's too much overhead, as it were. But when you get to about half a megabyte on average, you get two to three times performance increase for um, last 4K, which is pretty good. It's promising, and you can, uh, you can expect that images the police would be after would be maybe several megabytes, decent resolution. So this is quite good. What's even better is what happens when you look at uh, SSDs. So I've included the first 4K here because that is the fastest 
possible um, subfile approach because it's block aligned with the, the sectors or the pages on the disk and it's at the start of the file. So that's the first list, uh, the first numbered blocks you get to in the, in the metadata. And I don't know if you can see very well, but 3.4 here, 3.1, 25.7, 23.8. So it's quite close. If you're looking at the end of the file, you don't actually lose much performance than if you were looking at the start of the file. So again, pretty good. Uh, again, if you read slightly more data, it doesn't have a massive impact either. Going from 4K to 12K is only reducing it from, say, 23 to 17 or 70 to 53. So there is a penalty for reading a bit more data, but it's not too harsh. And the worst performing technique was looking at the start of the file and the end because you're jumping about. Yeah, sorry, I'll just get the last. And the final part is this technique was viable for all of the different approaches, but mainly last 4K and specifically on SSDs where on uh, even small, you know, 114 kilobyte images on average, it's still getting up to about seven times faster. And on half megabyte images, it was about 70 times faster. So it's obviously much better. And, oh, yeah, uh, I'll ignore that one. So uh, the signatures are unique. They're particularly good on SSDs. Still worthwhile on hard drives when they're not tiny images. Uh, we're thinking about the total cost of the transaction, whatever they might happen to include. So uh, file system, actual drive, time it takes to actually physically do things. And this kind of approach lays the foundation for forensics that is based on non-mechanical media, because we're, we're too entrenched in hard drive forensics now. We need to start thinking about how to optimize forensics for other types of media. And that much. was it. So I don't know much about forensics, but um, is, it, is it the case that sometimes it's done on uh, images rather than the original archive? Yeah, but you're still going through the same, uh, the same process, so you might image it separately and then import it in a, a tool afterwards. Yeah, I see. So, but then one outcome of your research might be that you're suggesting new techniques for imaging. You know, take the image on yeah. the SSD and uh, just, just look at the, well, that's the four kilobyte sections that you want. I think they actually do do that. Uh -huh. So most of the time, if they've done the, the thing completely separately and they've just got a separate drive with an image on it. Um, I've heard, I've seen rigs where they've got it set up with an, a RAID SSD of several terabyte SS, yeah. SSD space and you just dump it on there yeah. and that makes it much better. So they're copying the whole image then? Yeah, but I think they're doing that anyway a lot of the time. Mm. Whereas you could do this on a live system and uh, in conjunction with the selective parts I was talking about at the start where you could say, okay, we've parsed the, the file system and we found a couple of directories that look of interest. Yeah. Let's do this technique on those. Yeah. Um, two questions, if I may. Uh, the first part actually maybe more like an observation. If you have the analogy, you have this reservoir and the pool. Yeah. You have one tiny trickle. Uh, some ways of making it faster is to make more pools, but perhaps <laughs> that costs a lot more. Yeah, it, but you're still limited by what the device can actually do. So if you make more holes in a hard drive, it. Yeah, it's, you can process as fast as it comes off the disk, but you're still limited by that eight hour window. Whereas if you want something just to happen really quickly, you're gonna to have to make a sacrifice on what you're actually taking off the device. And in some cases, you might just want a fast result. So you can do something really quick and cheap and not very accurate, as long as you follow up afterwards. But a lot of the time they're just trying to put it in the right pile. So we're saying, okay, this is definitely bad. Let's look at this one. This is probably okay. And it's investigative triage at that point. You want to throw your resources in the right direction so that you're not wasting your time on something completely innocuous or you're not spending tons of time on something that is obviously bad. Okay. Yeah. So this, the second question is with um, selecting some parts of the file or the thing, um, what's the chance of false negatives? Or if you look into for, for this one? Yeah. So I, I didn't have more than the two data sets at hand at the time. So it was completely unique for 1.1 million images, even when I combined both data sets. Uh, reasoning about it, we're talking about two to the 4,096 possible combinations of, of those bytes. Um, and even if we're considering the fact that there might be some bias uh, compressing data, it's kind of like encryption in the, same, in the sense that it should be really high entropy and it should spread out quite evenly across this entire space. So I wouldn't expect it to clash short of maybe billions of images 
realistically. It may happen, but then you could do that with a few dice rolls anyway. So yeah, the, it, thinking about it that way, it should scale quite well. And then if it doesn't, then you add on one or two more blocks and you get the uniqueness you're looking for. How large are the actual libraries? How large are what, sir? The actual libraries of images that are free. Uh, I think Police Scotland's about five million, maybe six at this point. So a couple million you're expecting. You're not talking in the billions for this, at least. I was talking about this earlier when I was doing the poster. Um, so this isn't any weaker than traditional f full hashing, because you change one bit, an entire file, and you break full, ha full file hashing. <coughs> In this case, if you change that last 4K, then you will affect it. But you can shift it along. Because I'm doing it at the logical level, the, the byte alignment at the end doesn't matter. So you can shift it along, and it won't affect that signature. So the only way of breaking it is to actually change that part. Um, I mean, at the same time, you're, you're changing, you can change the rest of the file and still have that 4K bit at the end, and it would flag it up even if there's nothing there. But you're having to make a compromise at some point on what you're actually doing. And if it just means that you're looking at 10 images instead of 1,000, then you've already saved the investigator quite a lot of time. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's the question of the Because I noticed quite a lot of the fine details lost on this, and I think it's because yeah. the way the oh, lights are reflecting off it. Either that the projector is really low resolution. Yeah, maybe. Thank you very much. That was good. Well, thanks.
very dark blue, black or gray or all the colors ones. So it is, it is uh, wonderful. So and what is what one of my students find out that um, okay, so one particular finding is part of a type of attack. Uh, it it can uh, make a success in uh, the future. Why? Because they have another um, another thing in a network which is the object function. You know, object is like a, if you want to think about a portable and object function. Portable is like your house, and object function is your furniture. You can have your house, but it's different furniture. And he, 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 he try different furniture. And, uh, objects are one and zero and different. And they, they find out, you know, they're all of them are more So, and he's not what they're going towards. They're going to. Uh, you need to find that if you can, you can uh, find the anomalies on IoT network uh, based on machine learning and energy consumption. So uh, these are the approach that I'm uh, really interested in, like in terms of machine learning and cyber security or IoT. And obviously we wear and sensitivity are very much there that you could do this and it's interesting in the idea of actually getting the two the two new organisations to do it together. Um, and then even just to listen to the critical interest of what they're trying to do. And I'm particularly interested in terms of critical infrastructure. The investigations in that space and obviously the outcomes. So I'll be very much to the Yeah, and I've said to him, what is it? The amount of condition monitoring that's really going to be interested at the moment. For himself to make a talk to Scott Turner and say, okay, this is what we've done with this case study, it's really quick. We have access to those data sets, we've got a couple of years off, we've got them in terms of what's been good, what's an issue from the state in terms of the condition with their function. So we're actually discussing, or an issue in terms of a piece of machinery, we're going to have a part of it. And then the other thing that's really interesting is that we're going to have a part of it. And then the other thing that's really interesting is that we're going to have a part of it. And then the other thing that's really interesting is that we're going to have a part of it. Kind of the aspects or let's say characteristics which are so, it's 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 so I think there's an opportunity there. So I'm very keen for him to assist to get in contact and to see if we can help build a relationship. Yes. We do and then, yeah, we're waiting for the other side. And I think it's the inside of the time because there's a real push into the condition monitoring in the industry. Exactly, but then you just need to be able to do it. And they're vulnerable. And they're vulnerable, always. Because, you know, for example, I'm always telling you, I'm going to tell you, somebody hacks you, you're going to tell you something. The maximum thing that they can do is just make your own money and you left, left out with zero. Yeah. For critical infrastructure, we can kill people. Yeah. You know, they can kill people. Well, I, I've seen people lost to lose hands, arms, legs, uh, and luckily I haven't seen anybody who's died as a result of, of, of uh, an action or something. Yeah. That's amazing. But it would only be a matter of time. I mean, I, I'm actively involved in this investigation from the protocol and census. However, that informs very much a lot of the things that we do as a but also in terms of design best practice, so looking at security, making it in at the point at which you're designing a chip, you're writing code, or you're assembling a So that, that's very much of an interest as well. <laughs> Yeah, I'll give you my But um, if you have a business in the sense, we are, so we're, in, we're next door to the Technology Innovation Centre at Strathclyde University, the tech building. Um, so just, just near High Street Station, between High Street Station and Queen Street. And um, so we're easy to get to. And um, I'd be delighted if you would like to come along sometime and have a look at our IoT demonstration centre. Uh, and just have a bit more chat. So um, in terms of where we sit, we're talking about some of the three side of the security. Um, uh, integrators within really Scotland. So Alan obviously is here today and I had a catch up with him and that's great. And he knows what, what we're interested in. We can get involved in terms of six But also other than cyber security, we have an interest on the wireless communication side anyway. So we're talking to one of your we'll colleagues here and they've a project actually which we've we'll been using particularly actually. So I found that particularly interesting and timely to have that. So I mean I'm keen to look at the Obviously, in terms of reputation within this area, and the circumstances very much aligned to our interests. Thank you very much, and we are really want to work with you as well, you know, so maybe we can, we can uh, get some PhD in communication between the uh, organization and the organization. I think it's a good opportunity for us to help you find uh, 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 companies. <laughs> yeah, of course.
we are, with, and while we are not set up, we're set up to help industry. So it's very much from a, a drive from industry rather than academia. But what we do keep is up to date records of what each researcher is doing. So when we do go out and talk to the to companies, we can say, okay, we're aware of that they, 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 they're working in these areas. And, um, with so what's already been presented in the discussion is that it is the best that we are going to be very good. That would be lovely. And then at the end, you know, this is working on the water tank. So at the moment, the water is attack is happening. So they ended up leaving your tanks without water. So the entire city is going to be without water. So that's not much dangerous. But he's slowly still moving towards the water treatment, like a kind of the changing the chlorine. Is it chlorine? Uh, the amount of gas, less oh, gas, yes, yeah. you know, and, like that can kill people. You know, sure. so that, would, that would be like a more kind of critical than the ones we have at the And he's working towards the distillery as well. Well, I think that's a really interesting, 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 interesting space. One of the big challenges in the industry at the moment is um, releasing um, contaminated uh, water yeah, out no, into no, 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 rivers and such like it. That's a really big problem. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm working on a project actually with new tanks of, of water that's contaminated with various hydrocarbons and the issue there is um, they can't release this uh, past a certain uh, concentration and they, they are being monitored. They'll be monitored by the government to ensure that they don't release any of this and there's always a risk because of the fact that everything is automated that somebody remotely may trigger a set of, uh, well it won't just be a simple trigger but it could be a series of events. One affecting another, which would then release yeah. this, this, this. So, so, so it's definitely timely, yes, and it's a lot of interest in this space. Yeah, they should be quite good, honestly, because yeah. like, the same so, yeah. Yeah. in terms of IoT, and in terms of Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay for the, for the next no few problem. talks. I've got to go on to the, uh, the, the other event. But uh, um, I'll drop the email. That would be great. And would you mind to, uh, to select your best presenter? Yes, uh, I'll uh, offer the first three. Oh, Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, I was going to talk on cyberbullying. Next, or is it this? It's going to be here, but the cyberbullying. So what are going to talk about the model? Um, all right, thank you. If, uh, if I just have a sample, uh, here, and, uh, with this software, which worked better, I'm afraid I'm slightly biased. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you need to do some local analysis, don't you, on the stuff? Yeah, you can either do it with or
Okay, guys, can I have your attention? Thank you very much. Okay, so this is what I used to control. Uh, this one. Yeah, definitely. So this is forward. Oh, in yeah. down. This, this is. Do you want to try it? Forward and back. And then by lace it. You can lace it. Point it. Okay. Okay, so. Okay, guys, we have Kehindi from Edinburgh Napier University towards defeating metamorphic malware using genetic programming. So can I have your attention, please, everyone? Yeah, I think. I can, I can, yeah, if you hold this one, I can. Cyberbullying, I think the lady pulled out. The lady cancelled her presentation. Oh, oh yeah, unfortunately. Okay. So, so we're this moving is this on. one. Yeah, this is the model analysis using. Right. Okay. So, that's what I'm Sorry about that, guys.
Good afternoon, everyone. So, as Nagme has introduced me, I am Baba Bakende, um, a first year student here at Edinburgh Napier University. And um, my research is about defeating self mutating malware. So, we're looking at um, the application of evolutionary machine learning in metamorphic malware analysis and detection. So, I've got this outline, I'll do a run through of everything. By way of introduction, I would just like to define what a metamorphic malware is, for those that don't know. Um, a metamorphic malware is um, a malware that changes its code between generations. It does this by hiding its instruction codes in the host machine. Now, the thing about metamorphic malware is because it constantly changes its form, it can evade being detected by um, the traditional intrusion detection systems because most of them are trained to recognize only specific versions of code. And so when they see new versions of code, they have um, a difficult time handling it. So our research is in two phases. The first phase would look at how we can create variants of malicious binaries, that's the metamorphic malware, <coughs> using genetic programming, and then how we can create novel adaptations of the of already existing machine learning techniques that would be used to detect these metamorphic malwares. Okay, so some of the techniques that are often used by these metamorphic malwares include we have registry, registry swapping, instruction reordering, subroutine permutation, garbage code insertion. So registering swapping has to do with just changing the registry location, sort of like changing the sequence. Instruction reordering, where the order of instructions are just um, changed, provided that they don't have any um, dependencies. Then we have sub, um, subroutine permutation. So every code or every program has possibly n independent root that has um, n independent routines has n factorial possible variants so you can have so many variants of a particular code so it's just about altering those sub subroutines garbage code insertion so that means um, inserting any sort of junk codes so it could be like do nothing code codes that doesn't do anything you know or dead code so you want to just change the syntax or the structure of the code, but then the functionality is still retained. So there are certain layers this mutation can occur. So we have the network layer. So for instance, we have IP packets splitting, where you want to deliver several smaller versions of in, um, um, IP packets as opposed to one large um, packet. Then you have exploit layer. In, in this exploit layer, you have polymorphic shell code for instance, you can have um, alternate, alternative um, encoding where you have um, multiple layers of encoding. Then you can, on this layer is where you can also have things like junk codes being inserted into the um, original mal malicious binaries. And another layer is the application layer where, um, for instance, you can have what's called protocol rounds. So the malicious attacker can launch initially a very a clean, um, um, can just launch a clean attack, it, it's not an attack, can, sorry. So the malicious attacker can launch a clean round of protocol initially and then subsequently launch a malicious attack. Then SSL null record ev evasion involves when the malicious attackers try to take advantage of null records and they use it and then they insert malicious streams for a very valid um, session handshake. So um, briefly, we'll just look at some of the um, infection techniques. So we have cavity in, in session where you're just trying to exploit what is called cavities. Cavities are like unused portions of executables. The malicious attackers take advantage of that and insert uh, malicious content in those unused portions or cavities. Then we have jump table manipulation where the malicious attacker tries to redirect the host machine's execution, the host machine's execution by exploiting the content of the jump table and the jump table is what implements the control structure. So it's just sort of exploiting the control structures. Then data, um, data segment expansion so the malicious attackers try to expand the host machine's data segment so it can create space in the host machine's address space for, for itself to, um, to inject malicious content. So 
what we're trying to do is actually we want to first create um, malicious variants from an original malicious sample using genetic programming and then we can detect the metamorphic malware that we have created. <coughs> so I, what I really want us to take note of is the fact that we propose the use of genetic programming in, cre in the variant creation. Now what is genetic programming? So genetic programming is an evolutionary computing technique. Um, it's not so clear in this diagram. But the, the central, um, the focus of genetic programming is that you have an initial population that is created randomly, arbitrarily, and then you want to evaluate how fit the solution, the, the population is, that's the quality of the population. And based on the fitness of the population, the individuals in the population, you, sel you do s what is called selection, and then you can evolve those fit solutions and you keep doing this until a stopping criteria is reached. So your stopping criteria is okay an ideal solution is found or your stopping criteria might be okay we've reached a certain number of generations. Now you might want to ask why we use genetic programming. We use genetic programming for to basically two reasons. So when you want to search for um, mutants of code, that's variations in code, it involves searching a very huge, uh, you're exploring a very huge search space. And it has been shown that genetic programming has been effective in solving this, pro um, in solving this um, problem because it is very efficient in searching for variants of code. Also, from the works of um, the people I've mentioned here, White, Connie, Kenny, and Langdon, they have used um, genetic programming efficiently in changing codes and making the codes efficient and optimized. And that's another reason why we use genetic programming. So um, people, pre pre previously people have used genetic mo programming in metamorphic malware detection. So um, these two, um, the two authors here have, also, have used genetic programming. However, when they use genetic programming, they only focus on the ability of the malware variants to be able to ev evade being detected by intrusion detection system, which is actually quite good. But then the fitness landscape is not really um, informative, and so it doesn't really guide the evolutionary process. So our fitness function is going to consider um, more factors, and I will talk about the fitness function um, later on. Now, this, I haven't um, gone through what people have done. We have come up with um, a few research questions. So we're looking at the extent to which genetic programming can be used to create <coughs> new variants of malicious code that can evade being detected by intrusion detection systems and how we would be able to detect these metamorphic malwares by using already, um, already established machine learning techniques and then we want to also maximize performance so we want to determine what are the fitness functions we can use in, in both the machine learning and genetic programming parts that would help us maximize performance. So this is also my research methodology. So we would collect our data and their Android-based data. Then we'll process them and convert them into GP-readable format. And the GP-readable format is just control flow graphs. Then we would evolve, after, then we would evolve the malware. We try to create the variants of the malware. Then when we have created the variants upon de 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 defining the fitness function, we would create um, we'll just adapt existing uh, machine learning techniques but there will be, this will be novel adaptations that can detect the metamorphic malware that we have created and we evaluate our results. Now so by just preliminary work that we have done, I mean my first year, so we just did a lot of re literature review to identify the gaps and then we've tried to unpack the malicious binaries from APK files, Android based files to Smiley files and we were able to convert the um, binaries to GP readable format which are just control flow graphs. Then we have defined our mutation operators which would be variable renaming would obviously also insert junk codes as well to create variation in the population as well as method renaming and also we have also been able to formulate our fitness function as given below. So in our fitness function, like I said, most of the previous works have actually focused on 
the ability of the um, variants just to be able to evade being detected by intrusion detection systems. But we also want to ensure that first one, the first function there is the executability of the malicious binaries. So after making um, changes to the initial uh, malicious binaries, we want to ensure that they, still, they are still executable and they retain their malicious, um, malicious intent. Then we also want to look at the similarities between the original um, malicious binaries and the variants we've created, and the similarities between their signatures upon converting them to the, their signature form. And also we also want to look at behavioral similarities. So that's what comprises our fitness functions, fitness function, which will guide the evolutionary process. So um, by way of conclusion, um, we believe that our, the proposed work is going to be very effective in terms of the fact that when we create the variants of the code, we have a large data set of, of variants of, ori of an original malicious data set, which would be also a very good way of testing the current intrusion detection systems to see how efficient and effective they are. And the second phase also involves um, creating novel adaptations of machine or already existing machine learning techniques that will be able to create these metamorphic malwares. Now the machine learning techniques will be trained on a larger data set because you are not just looking at the first original binary, you are also looking at the variants and the mutants. And so because it is trained on a larger data set, we hope that the detection rate would be higher and there will be lower false positives. Thank you for listening. These are my references. Thank you. Any questions? Is this a finished project or is it still going on? It's going on. I'm in my first year of my PhD. Uh, Within the context of the research, we use the genetic programming in the creation of the metamorphic malware. So we use it to create the metamorphic malware. Um, in terms of the, so we are trying to create um, malware using genetic programming that changes its code. So the genetic programming, we're not, we've not established the fact that we're going to use this in the second phase of the research because we are, we, we, we we know that there are certain disadvantages of using you know, genetic programming here. So when I say um, towards defeating, we're using it, the genetic programming to create the malware, the metamorphic malware alone. Then for detecting, so we're looking at possibly using Bayesian um, techniques for Bayesian networks for the detection bit. So um, not necessarily evolutionary computing. Yeah. Actually, building on to that, I was just wondering if the technique you have could be for predicting what might come up in the future, some sort of maybe new strain will be exhibited with these characteristics. Is that possible to apply for that kind of prediction approach? Yeah. So when we're for the bits where we're creating new um where we're trying to create variants of the original malicious binaries, we're trying to so we're trying to predict in, in, in a way, we're trying to predict the um, differences there would be. So that's why um, the possible differences there would be between an original binary and subsequent generations. So we sort of infuse that bit, if that's what you're asking. I don't know if that's what you're asking. Um, to some extent, yes, but just, maybe we'll take it offline later. Okay. But like, we're, look, we're, we're doing a mimicry attack, so we're trying to create several variants. That's the first stage, is to create several variants of an original binary. So it's more like we're envisaging the different forms the original binaries can take. And that's what we're using to train the, um, that's what we would use to inform the um, later part, which is the detection process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
application rather than what it looks like in terms of a, a binary file. So I didn't get your question. Like it, the, the problem that you're trying to solve, a, yes. a, a self-mutating file, yes. is sort of beaten by using sandboxing to examine what the behaviour of the file does rather yes. than actually um, what the file um, checksum is or what the actual file's um, critical behaviours. So that, that sort of solves this problem without knowing what the file looks like? Mm, I'm not really sure if um I get you correctly, but what this does in terms of the first bit of it, that's creating metamorphic malware, what it actually does is that we try to create variants of the original code. Now, we, are look, we want to make sure that the original code and the variant are as dissimilar as, um, as possible, so that's why we're looking at the behavioral, um, we're going to, part of the fitness function looks at behavioral differences between the original code and the um, variant. Then we also look at the, so that's behavioral based analysis and in terms of um, the normal signature based analysis, we also look at the signatures and their similarities as well as the original files and their similarities. So I don't know if that's, so that's just the first bit of the research work. Then we try to look for how we can detect these um, metamorphic malware using um, machine learning techniques. So right now we're trying, we've been able to formulate the problem to an extent, so other aspects of the, of possible things that would come up would, will address. But I don't know if that's what you're asking. Well, what I'm saying is antivirus vendors now are already yeah. sandboxing the, the potential problem file, yes. looking at what it does. Mm -hmm. So perhaps that's something worth talking to them about because they've sort of avoided this problem okay. by going to that next level. Potential problem is the key word. Okay. What this work is doing is spotting the stuff as a potential problem. Then you can sandbox yes. it. But until it's spotted as a potential problem, you can't the sandboxing in the work. But it's executable, isn't it? Yeah. It'll work if it's spotted as a potential problem before you bother sandboxing it. That's the thing. Yeah. It's a question of priority. Thank you very much. Any questions, guys? Yes. Yeah. Well, the behavior, what, what, the behavioral differences is, it's, the, the behavioral similarities is just one bit of it, but quite frankly, we really, it's, we're looking, we're not just looking at the behavior, that's why we're not looking only at the behavioral differences, if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that can feed into the classic kind of signature data as antimicro. Yes. I think it's your question is a clever bit as well to see whether you are inducing changes in the In the behaviors. Yes. Because if the behavior is the same, then obviously that can be caught by. Yeah, I get your point. So, like, a, a possible thing would be that. There, would, the, the, there wouldn't be so much change in behavior, so it's still sort of like a static analysis way. So that's something to look, look at, to look at so probably in the future, though. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh,
this one as well for this. I need to introduce you. Is it a echo? Uh, Elo Okwando. I'm just going to use this for introducing. Okay, guys, we have uh, Mr. Elo Okwando from Edinburgh Napier University, Secure Threshold Cloud Disaster Management. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Elo Okwando. Just uh, writing up my thesis, and this is one of the potential uh, application area of our thesis. So we're trying to. While we're trying to study, we're actually working on data availability and how to scale um, all manner of data to using multi-cloud so we can improve data sharing in the multi-cloud, depending on whichever size. So we, d we, d we define a concept we call fragmented secure system. Now we're looking at the potential storage area, application area of our system. We're looking at how to mitigate disaster using secure threshold cloud architecture. The system is secure on its own. As we go on, we see, understand that. Then we are looking at possibly the statistics you normally see most of the times. We are looking at issues about cloud disaster. You can see the comparison between three different cloud service providers and how it has been used. The kind of cloud outage you normally have about that. You see that from 2015 to 2017, most likely Microsoft has the highest level of what cloud outage. The reason is that. Most of the current uh, disaster management system is based on recovery, what is known as RTO. We'll come to that. But if you look at this, you can see some of the causes of most of the cloud activities. You can see the statistics of the cost. You can see about human errors of the highest percentage, and there about when our system actually takes care of all this. Then what has been done? There are several works which I don't want to bother you about, but. We just took some few of them to show you what is being done. Remus is all about trying to preserve the, the software layer of the VM by using what is called, um, it's just trying to preserve by using what is called speculative uh, execution. So he has, Remus tried to do, if you, have, if you create an AVM, it then multiplies it and make sure that all the executions try to get in touch with all of the systems so that the system runs concurrently at the same time so that if one fails, it transfers the control to other VM. In that order, the software, you don't have to begin to configure the software of the new VM altogether. So you try to run multiple VM together, doing one thing. Then look at the second side. Second side try to improve the, the high VM availability of Remus. Then we look at the DR crowd. The DR crowd is talking about disaster recovery crowd. It uses uh, cumulus, which is a pile of different clouds. So what it does is that if we, it uses replication to store your data, of course, you get the data, encrypt it, then move it to one cloud, replicate it into a different cloud, so that if one fails, it transfers control to the next one. If this one fails, what is called warm site, hot site, and cold site. In that order, it arranges the site, so that if one fails, it transfers to the next one. In that order, what actually all these are trying to do is that they are trying to reduce, because in cloud, Disaster management, we have two major objectives RPO, which is recovery point objective and recovery time objective. What it simply means is that when a cloud fails, what time is it that is safe enough to recover? So, all the studies in recent times are trying to minimize that time to make sure that the recovery is at the minute second. But the point is that there is always what a failure, and the failure is based on what recovery. And we look at this and discover that. There is no amount of recovery, even if, per sec even if it's the least second. Once disaster happens, there is a business downtime. And sometimes it can be very costly because if you are having a cloud service provider and you are hosting data of so many um, multinationals, time is of essence to them. So even if it takes you about maybe one second or two to recover back, it might take some of them back more than one hour to be able to reconnect back again. So that little time is of essence. So, and of course, you know the business of this time, time is of essence. So a little time you lose can be very costly into the system. So all, this, all the disaster management systems are based on recovery. But our own is not based on recovery. Well, look at why does this concept demand attention? So knowledge economy needs timely data ability for decision making. So if you're going to do something and you, have, you lose customers, you lose, you lose so on um, data, and sometimes there are a lot of leakages. You can see that another thing that most of the cloud service providers, this is for you to, be able to subscribe to them, you have to sign different multiple service layer agreements. 
Sometimes you serve, if you don't subscribe to disaster recovery, disaster recovery will not be given to you in that order. So there are multiple agreements you need to sign to be able to be safe using a particular class service providers. Then in each of these outages, there are basically losses. Sometimes, you, of course, you know that when data is encrypted and saved into the cloud, most of the time the key, encryption keys are stored along with what with the data you, you, you store. So sometimes if you, either the, the data is lost or the keys are leaked to the public. So most of these things are not good for business. Then basically, in overall, this put fear in cloud users. Say, ah, I know somebody who has been telling me say, anything about cloud, I don't want to talk about that because I'm afraid of losing what I have. Of course, you know that most of the fears people have is once you, you outsource your data, you're no longer in control. The service providers are in control of it. So what's our approach to all this? We're looking at Adi Shami's work. Like I said before, our work looked at Adi Shami and George Blakely, who talks about how to break a data into shares and then define out of those shares the number you can use to recover the original data. Then we know, like I said before, this study has limitations because the original concept is based on a system that cannot, but basically the original thought and concept is based on using it to protect encryption keys. But we discover that this is very resilient, so we're using it to go beyond encryption keys to talk about what data of different sizes. So we are now looking at Alice Shemir's work, which defined the concept of breaking file into shares and using a portion of it to recover the data. Then, of course, it's very much secured because one is that the system is self-encrypted. You don't need the encryption key to use the system because the data is broken into a meaningless shares by which except you're able to get the maximum threshold and use the appropriate uh, uh, algorithm, you can't recover original file. So it is completely secure. So if you get a portion of the file, you can't make meaning out of it because it doesn't, you can't get anything out of it. So, and then the system uses a multi-cloud architecture in its implementation because formerly it was used it just within the system, but now we have, it has been scaled over in use of what's in cloud. As so what I mean by multi-cloud is that, take for instance, you have a file, you want to break it into five shares out of which you can use two to recover it. It simply means that you're going to subscribe to five different buckets, possibly using one service provider or using multiple service providers, whichever one it means. It means that, but you must use one or what, more than one service provider or more than one cloud bucket. And system is resilient. The reason why it is resilient is that failures do not really affect it, except you reach to the maximum threshold which you use to recover the file. So it is resilient on its own. Then what are we doing? We now, we are, in our study, we use 10 different cloud service providers, but we use more of three, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft, and possibly Dropbox. But in this one, we use more of AWS, because to some extent, AWS has a good record of having stability. But we use AWS in different, so unfortunately, it's not really not clear, different places. We use AWS Ohio, Canada, London, Japan, uh, Mumbai, we subscribe to all of them. Then here, what we actually do is that we split the data into different shares, 10 different shares, and then we have what's called a share mapping table. What it simply does is that when you create the shares using the sharing algorithm, you send it to the cloud by making a token call, you send it to the cloud. When you send it, the system recover, returns back the share location back to the table. That's what they have the share mapping table. Sorry, it's not very clear on this. What is, so when he returns that, the system you now have in the table how we can locate the shares each time we want to recover it. Because each of those share information on the table contains the share location, the name of the shares, and everything about the class service provider. So that's what I did here. You break the shares into multiple, in, the data into multiple um, shares using the data store. Then when you now make it, an API call, send it to the cloud, it returns back using the mapping table. The essence of this mapping table will help you at each time you want to get, it will show you where to share is and the name of the file and everything. And when you want to recover the file back, the name of the file, everything is stored in the mapping table. So you have all this information in the table. This is what, so we will now break files into multiple shares and then store them 
using the mapping table, we can always locate where the file is. Even the original file, the file name and everything about it, we have it stored. So anytime you want to recover it, you recover the system back using that. Then we did that. And in our own concept, we tried to fail some cloud. What do we mean by failing some cloud? Just go to the way, what we simply do is just, we just go to the code where we have the API code, just block it off, meaning that the cloud has failed, you can have access to it. So we tried it using from, we look at this, uh, our systems that one is that we tried it. First of all, we have a kilobyte of shares, and then we, we define a policy called three from five. Then we did it normally as supposed to be five shares recovering from three. We recovered it at about 7.8 seconds. Then, but we tried to fail one of those clouds out of those five to see whether we can recover it. We recovered it at 6.52 seconds, meaning that for, at the 20% failure of the cloud, you, this is, the recovery time will be 1.2 here, 16.41% faster. Then we now discover that we now did it again for a 10 kilobyte of file, which is the key. Actually, we are trying to use, use it, uh, keys. They will now have for a 40% failure of the cloud. We will have it at 51.8% faster. So it simply shows us that. In as much as the cloud failure is not up to the threshold, the faster the recovery is. Because what do my recovery? The simple, the simple logic there is that if you are using five clouds to store your data, what it simply means is that when you split, you split into five and you store into all those five, and all the records of that five are returned back to the mapping table. So when you want to recover the file again, the system has to scan through the mapping table for all the five of them, and then goes to all of them to recover the file. What it simply means is that we need to recover five of the shares and put them in the memory. In the memory, the system will now pick the best of the three of the best of the five, and they use the recovery original file. So if you're not doing, if at the end of the day you don't need to go to all, to all the five, it simply means that you have to what the system will recover very very fast because that time it will take to recover the other one or two that we are lost is added as was well, advantage to the system. So. The more the cloud fails, the faster the recovery is, and the better the performance, in as much as it is not, does not exceed what the threshold. So we now discover that this has a potential application in mitigating cloud disaster management. So rather than focusing on recovery, this has the capacity of keeping your business continuously running without fail. Now, when I talked about in our proposal, I present, we presented a, a work which we did, which we looked at as the future work. The future work is that define a self-organizing system in the sense that those, even when the system gets into the maximum threshold, the system has a way of reorganizing itself because it knows from the record it takes from each of the cloud behaviors which one has the potential of failing. So in that order, the system takes care of that because we're using linear regression model to see the cloud behaviors and then foresee the behavior of the cloud ahead of time. And then anyone that shows potential danger, the shares that were sent into it are changed. What it simply means is that we will not change it to the one the system that behaves better. And thereby, at the mapping table, the, the, all the information about the, the cloud which was failed will be removed why the new, return, the new ones are returned to the table. So each time, if what, so that one that had the, the system that's capable of failing, is no longer a problem because one, even if you have it, you can't recover original data. But what we we'll do is that when we do that, we we'll go to those cloud service providers, delete all the files, run a delete command. It will wipe up all the shares in that particular command while we maintain the ones in the other command. It has no, there's no cause for alarm because even if that cloud failed within that period, we won't be afraid because those shares that are contained in this cloud has no potential of revealing the original file. So we now looked at it and said, this our work has the potential of being what used to mitigate cloud failure. Rather than depending on disaster recovery, we now focus on what mitigating failure. In that order, the business continues to run without being afraid of failure of any type. So if you look at this, just the results which you showed before. This is just a graph of it. How many minutes do I have? What second do I have? So we'll just conclude. We discovered that current cloud disaster management mechanisms have been focused on what do we want? Faster recovery, just trying to re reduce the re recovery time objective, but not on mitigating the failure itself. So we simply talked about. Then we look at 
club outages result to losses and leakages. I could know when it happens, there are basically losses and leakages of different types. Then mitigating cloud outage is possible using cloud threshold system. What I mean by threshold now means that a certain number of the cloud which you have can always use to recover your file. So you rotate it within that place. Basically, it's even good that when you do it all over for a period of time, you actually know the service providers are very much reliable. So you focus on using those services. The number, make it as a threshold. So if you have about three, just focus on within the area. Make sure that the threshold rotates within those good ones. So we said, oh, such a system is as, system work is as much as outages are not exceeded. Now we propose what we said, which we did in our poster, a self-organizing system whereby the system maintains itself and to make sure that anyone that has potential, yeah, the capacity of being felt is not longer used in the subsequent work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, any questions? Uh, yeah. Yes. You're, you're essentially splitting data over a bunch of services and you might all have different policies about data. Is, is the idea that it's all encrypted so it doesn't really matter because you can't recover it anyway? Or do you think there's other implications for storing data in a fragmented um, way like this? Yeah, it's not encrypted. It's self-encrypted on its own. So the concept of maybe you don't have any fear of losses or people having access to it. Even when it is in a multi-tenant system, people having access to it because the data in this home is self-encrypted, just like have homomorphic encryption. The system in itself is self-secured, so you don't need to talk about how the key is managed or where is the key is stored or what kind of encryption is it using. Is it using AES? Is it using cha cha 20? You don't need to bother about all those things because the, the system itself is self-secured on its own. When we talk about, and of course, like you talk about each of the service providers you want to you want to get involved with, actually you have to sign an agreement with them of the storage cost for each of them. So at each time you're using the service, sending and retrieving, you of course pay the, the, the cost. But I think the good news about it is that the storage is very cheap. So even if you use multiple storage services, it's very cheap. Most of the ones we did, actually we have free services for one year or two years or whatever, which they actually give you, if like the AWS you use, we use about 10 different buckets. If you sign up with AWS, they give you about 300, uh, I think 300 dollars or about 300 pounds per hour per, per year. So for the whole one year, you and as much as we did it several times, we, we are left with 200 something pounds. So it's almost not something to be afraid of in terms of the the, the storage and which of the services you use. Before, before you sign, of course, you must have to read through it and then understand what is going on. So I think the concept of GDPR is a new concept that came out in 25th May. So each time you want to sign up, you need to look at the implication of what they're signing. I hope you answer answered your question. Yeah, of course. Okay. I actually have a question regarding the, uh, because you talk about uh, selecting three app, best three app of five. So uh, my question is, have you done any optimization, any particular algorithm to find out if you need to go for three out of five or five out of, you know, four out of five? So what was your status? Sorry if I missed it. Yeah, yeah sorry. It's, I didn't have it here, actually, but the whole concept of the work we did, we studied different types of policies, different types of file sizes, to be able to know the combinations you need to have at each point in time. It's not part of this work. What's actually looking at is the potential storage area. When you look at what actually helps you to look at the policies we use from our study is that the policies you use, whether it is two from five or three from five or thereabout, one is that, like you were talking about, one, you need to ask yourself, how many class service providers am I going to use? You know what I'm saying? If I'm using five, and which one am I going to use? It's part of the study we have, but it's not here. It's just trying to show you different behaviors of the class service providers, and which one we think that is best behaved. It's not, part, it's not here. So when you look at those class service providers, you know, I said, okay, of course you need to check out how much do they charge. If cost is your inhibiting factor, you can look at the cost of each of the service providers. Then when you look at that, you look at you discover that the charges you have for class services depends on one, 
both storage and retrieval, you pay for it as well. So you look at, look at if cost is an, a, a function for you, you look at, look at one is that if I'm using AWS and, and sending and retrieving from there, will it cost me more? Do they, are they more reliable? So these are the, it depends on what you are looking for. If cost is an implication to you, you look at the one that is cheaper and they use it to maintain your threshold. But it has also an implication as well in terms of the, the speed of recovery based on the file size. But we didn't talk about So these are the things we need to look into, which is part of our studies. When you look at those things, you now see which other you're going to use. But basically, the, the, the smaller the threshold, the faster the recovery, but it depends on the fire size. If your size size becomes very big, it becomes very difficult to pull in and then bring back again. So you have to expand it. So if your size size is very small, we advise you go for a lower threshold, even if you have up to five or six classes. Just use a lower threshold because even if you store five, they only charge you for storage. They won't charge you for retrieval. So you look at the cheaper ones to do your retrieval. And you can always switch between these five based on which one you like. Then for us to know which one is the, the, the one to use, you need to look at the time of arrival. Because if you are doing three out of five, it means that the first three that comes in are the one the system are going to use to recover the original file. The other two will not be used and does not make any, it's not of any security implication because if you get them, you can't recover the file, original file. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys, we have Dr. Chombolu here. So he's a lecturer in computer science within the College of Engineering, Mathematics, and Physical Science at the University of Exeter. His research interests focus on developing model-based and machine learning algorithms to solve problems such as wireless networking and remote sensing. Thank you. So this is the last uh, program of this workshop. I will try to make it as short as possible so that it's more enjoyable. And sorry, I should have come early today, but my flight was uh, uh, delayed. So this somehow lead me to thinking about my talk. So when you, do you do sports? Occasionally. Occasionally. So as researchers, I mean, I think we as a group of people, which probably are under the average to do sports, and which is somehow very important for us. So in order to be very good at sports, for example, I will take badminton as an example. If you try to improve your skills, the best way is to play with your mate. And your mate probably should be at the same level like Q. If your mate is too bad, your skills will probably slide down after some training, which is that bad. If your mate is too good, so you will lose the interest very soon. And then that would not be very good for your training. So what's the best way? You find a peer almost at the same level, you practice. You both practice with each other. After some time, you will find that your skills have improved, and your mate's skills would improve, would be improved. So that's actually the key idea of my talk today. I will use another example to be a little bit more related to network intuition. For network intuition, it's like you are trying to fight against an enemy. In the market, suppose in the market, there is a police, that's you. You try to catch a guy who is generating fake product. So the best way for you to both to improve your skills, suppose if the, the guy who is producing bad things, to improve the skills, is for you to both like uh, keep training against each other. After some training, the guy who is producing fake product has the skills so improved that uh, almost like a true product. For the policeman, 
because you have seen so many of the very good uh, fake uh, product, you are able to tell uh, to tell if this like uh, product is fake or not, even though they both look very much like each other. So that's the adversarial learning. That's my talk today. Uh, my uh, it will cover the following part. The background we just cover the machine learning, which is a very hot topic recently for security, the machine learning skills, the challenges in current systems, and our methods. Our method use this adversary um, model to solve one particularly challenging problem. We know that we have already got some very good machine learning algorithms like here, and the support the SVMs, log logistic regression, and random trees, or even DNNs. They mostly work on very, pro, uh, on a, they work on a data set that have many training data. In security area, particularly in network security area, one notorious problem is you can deal with all the problems very easily. But oh, usually it is the little problems that cause the significant troubles. If you have a look at what has happened in the past a few years, the emerging network intrusion problems, the emerging attacks, they cause significant disrupt to our systems. And these are actually the most difficult um, task we have to address. The general model for machine learning is to have a data set X and Y. X is the input of your model, Y is the label. If X is labeled as good data, so that's fine. If X, the label X, Y here is bad, so that means it's intuition. Many scientists are working on this F, the system. No matter how good or how bad your system is, they can be abstracted as F, as simple as that. The advantages of current systems, it has high speed, high detection accuracy, no force around it. But as I just mentioned, they need to have nodes of training data. And also, this data needs to be somehow correctly, and correctly labeled, both the negative, that means the um, good data, and the positive data. So that means the intuition, uh, the intuition data. These two data sets, well, the set, uh, data set with two categories, they need to be balanced. And most of the time, we will have a very big data set with a lot of normal data. But the problem, has, the problem as I just mentioned, the true intuition data is limited. Some guys have proposed some algorithms here try to improve that. For example, the word embedding and semi-supervised learning. But they are not very, very effective in um, addressing the emerging network intuitions. By the way, I have quite a strong accent. If you feel that you can't hear, understand what I'm talking, anytime you are welcome to interrupt me. And when I moved to Exeter, some colleagues told me that I have already picked up some uh, Glasgow accent. <laughs> <laughs> when I was working in UWS, yeah, uh, Irish, as well. Irish, accent. Irish accent, yes. <laughs> yes. So the, uh, they, saw, they said that uh, Edinburgh is a posh city. Glasgow is just a city. <laughs> so uh, anyway, let's come back to the, uh, our problem here. The challenges of current systems, the first one is the data imbalance can be a common problem in many 
uh, network security areas. Small sample, so that means we do not have too many, no matter good or bad samples. And then there are some errors that cannot be uh, uh, neglected because the model has some limitations or the data has some limitations. Our work here, we are proposing a generative model trying to augment the data. So because the data is a key here, particularly the emerging attack data is a key here, we need to find ways to augment that data so that our model, no matter current model is based on an SVM or LR or uh, deep networks, so that uh, to make sure these models can have enough food to eat and to get trade. Our methods are based on the two techniques. The first one is the probability model. The second one is the GAN model. The GAN model, the probability model, I will talk about it first. It estimates the distribution of the targeted data by trying to maximize the posterior probability. Suppose X is our emerging attack data. Omega is a feature. So the probability models try to improve, try to maximize that posterior probability. There are a few established algorithms like MCMC, MH, and Gibbs sampling. Uh, these methods generally have the following two limitations. The first one is, is low convergence speed. Low convergence, that means the algorithm, even though they can work, but it needs some time to converge into the good solution. The second limitation here is it has less representation power. The posterior probability, even though it can capture some simple features, but usually our current attack network intrusion data have rich features. The data set we have been using, the number of features scale from 30, around 30 to 100. The current posterior model and the probability model cannot effectively capture that. There is another tool which has been quite popular in computer vision recently. That is the generative uh, adversary network, GAN model. That model is composed of two basic deep networks. The first network is the policeman. The, the policeman tries to tell if the generated data is fake or true, genuine or fake. The next uh, network is the uh, um, is an artist artist who tried to create some artistic good work, uh, but uh, of course it's fake. So these two, based on the adversary training, they improve each other until it converges. We are able to have a uh, two deep networks. The first deep network is able to generate good data. The second one is trying to, is able to identify the smallest difference. The limitation, of course it's not a perfect model. It has some limitations. The first limitation is it cannot start from the scratch. The model needs to get some data to start. And then the next one is if we are not training it carefully, for example, if the two network has different uh, converging speed, they cannot learn much. It's like you, know, you are playing with an uh, Olympic uh, player. So you certainly assume you will give up your interest. It's, a, uh, it's similar in this uh, training. Th this is the home pipeline for our system, our proposed system. Uh, it's quite simple, from data collection to data preparation, uh, pre processing to data partition from 
this is the training stage, and this is the, t the test stage. At the training stage, we collect some data, parti uh, uh, partition them, and then try some data management, for example, sampling and also augmentation, and then categorize them to treat our network. After that, use the treat network to detect if the uh, if the input data, emerging data, are attacks or normal data. At the training phase, the normal data, network data, are randomly selected, while the intrusion data are augmented to form the balanced training data set. At the test stage, the new data, the network data is fed into our trade network so that we can see if the input data is uh, intrusion or not. The key of the whole, the whole pipeline is this part, the data augmentation component. That component is the one we have, I have spent quite a lot of time to talk. Suppose we have cyber attacks, and then these are the very limited number of data we know at this moment. It is fed into the generative network, and also there are some not the noise, they are fed into the Python gamma, this model, and then uh, fed into the deep network. After that, we are able to generate some augmented cyber attack. Why is this uh, PG, Python gamma model, useful here? It is used to um, power our um, generative network, the GAN network. Forget these ugly equations. I, to be honest, most of them I don't understand. My students are right here. So, why the gamma PG model is important here? It is able to capture both the two types of features of network intrusion data or normal network data. If we have a look at the data, examine the data by eyes, we can easily see that there are two types, or a few types of uh, features in these data um, items. Most of them are like this, accumulative network features, for example, the time, the address, the frequency of connections. There are another field, there are some other fields with binary input, zero, one, and these, for example, the Boolean values. So that's why we use the PG model to capture the, these two types of, um, of features. And then the, this is the introduction about the GNN, so that's the model, the ping pong, well, the, the ping pong model. The generator learns the latent true distribution of the intrusion data. The discriminator try to reject the poor, the bad, product, you just, you haven't done very good to do fake work. And then, the network structure G and D, they try to get trade with each other. And then after that, so G, the generator, we have the same output like the input layer. Why? Because of course, it's trying to generate some fake data. So the input should be, and the output, they should have the same. Well, they should look exactly the same if you are, they are doing a good job. The discriminator, the DLET, has one output. Either it is intrusion detection, uh, intrusion, or um, not intrusion detect, uh, intrusion. So that's good data. Um, the PG model is trying, is being used to pre-train the GAN, this is a GAN, so the, this is a discriminator and this is a generator. Uh, the objective of the whole training is trying to minimize the difference. Once we get the network somehow warmed up, the second stage is fine tuning. Fine tuning is uh, uh, was a very common technique used in, uh, in, in neural networks in computer vision. We use the very, very limited number of data we know, they are true intrusion, to find to our discriminator and the generator. After that, our network is 
going to is fine, should be okay to do some tests now. So that's the result. Um, we specifically se selected um, a few for intrusion categories of the KDD carb 99 dataset because they have limited training samples and they have large testing records, which are exactly like the in practice. In practice, so we have loads of data, we don't know whether they are attacked or they are good data. We have very limited number of no data. That we, we know that these are uh, an intrusion. The result, so uh, for the first data set, we can see the, the two the two rows here are the results which have used our augmented data set. As you can see, the accuracy, it has the highest accuracy, better than all the ones before. Uh, sorry, there are many like uh, special words here. Uh, just have a look at the last two. So LR, LR means uh, linear regression, SVM. That's another very popular method, uh, supporting vector machine. Uh, this is a very old one without the augmentation. This one with augmentation, but without the, um, the GAN network. The last two columns, uh, nodes, are the results of ours. Uh, the precision, also it has the highest, for example, if we compare SVM, 93, higher than 91, higher than 86. The same for linear regression, 33, higher than 25, higher than 25. And for the recall, uh, first of all, the last uh, uh, column should be as low as possible. And also you can see our method has the lowest uh, um, first alarm. The second page almost tells the same story. If you have a look at the last two rows, both two methods are higher than the others. The same, the same. Conclusion. Uh, this research confirms that our method is able to, uh, uh, to address the emerging network intrusion challenge which has been around with us for many years and we uh, continue to be a very challenging task in network intuition detection. Our PG model is able to uh, generate some input to train the GAN network. The GAN network is able to generate some augmented data set that is able to help improve the current uh, network intrusion machine learning models, no matter it is neural regression, SVM, and neural networks. I didn't list the neural networks work here because this, has, this work is finished a few days ago and the results are just out yesterday, I think, which are also good. Yeah. Uh, those are some references. Uh, we are going uh, the um, the paper. The current draft is in archive. If you are interested, you can ask me. Uh, we are also going to publish the the source code once we get the whole work done. Thank you. Yes. Uh, which one? Um, so you, you say that you've been able to generate realistic intrusion? Uh, the realistic here in, um, in statistics, we usually call it the distribution. So the distribution, if the, the, the both two types of data, they have the same distribution, usually we treat them as uh, almost the same. So that's uh, uh, realistic here. That's the meaning of realistic. Yes. So, um, and at some point, you 
example, when you talk about the uh, trend in your uh, model on uh, KDD, uh, KDD COP99. Yes. So uh, my approach is how you're detecting the emerging network detection when you train your data on the old data sets. Good question. Uh, what I mean here, emerging attack, uh, that's uh, usually uh, this word is used to capture the kind of situation that uh, we have limited, very limited knowledge of the attack. So in order to do that, we just sem uh, used a very small, very small number of input data. It's uh, something like uh, in the emerging attack scenario. We know we have some limited knowledge of the intrusion data, but the number is small. And how about the zero-day attacks? So that you don't have any signature, you don't have any sample in, the, you know, in your training sample. Would, would you be able to detect those attacks? Like Very good. So usually, if you know it's an attack, that means you have already got some data. It cannot be just zero. Otherwise, the kind of attack hasn't even started yet because you didn't know you, have, you are under an attack. Okay, and another question is, uh, you talk about the, you know, your advantages of your approach, like your data imbalance and also a small data. Mm. So, uh, for example, they have like a cost-effective approach, for example, in machine learning. Okay? Yes. So they, they put a bigger penalty on a minority class. Okay? Yes. So Hmm. So, uh, can I ask you that what is, the, what is the difference between your approach and machine learning approach? Um, between machine learning approach and adversarial network intrusion detection? Our, the difference? our method is uh, one belongs to machine learning, the, the big umbrella. Uh, just in the machine learning, under it, deep networks, uh, GN. It is one example of machine learning approach. Yeah. And uh, what, what is the, your uh, strategy to select the uh, sample that you can use to randomly select, select some sample to train your model? What was your strategy to select that? So, sorry, when you said Just random, for yeah, example. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, for example, uh, use distributions just to randomly, uh, uh, normal distribution. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. It's not so much a question, I just thought the analogy was really good, the biometric analogy. It gave me quite a lot of insight into uh, the, how the two networks play against each other. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, I just thought that was worth mentioning. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to use your approach to actually defeat the intrusion detection as opposed to learn to the And We are working on the basic methods, so the academic research. We did. We are doing this project for a big company, big network company, and then the next stage is to apply the approaches we have been developing here to their um, product. It hasn't been used into a real industry environment. Based on the test here, with some, the KDD cup is. Uh, is probably the most fundamental or most significant competition in the data science area, in the academic area. So I think if we are able to test our system in this competition, it should be, pos uh, be uh, possible to apply into a real world scenario. Uh, if I understand your question well, um, we, after the training, we don't use the generator. So the guy who is producing bad, uh, bad things uh, is not used. Of course, we can use it, but we use the discriminator to do the kind of detection work. We can use that, yeah. Thank you.
front of you. So I would appreciate if you would select the present presenter. And if you are the presenter, so you can select yourself as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's okay to select yourself. So it's only one, please select only one uh, you know, your presentation. And so you can select your Sorry Thank for too you. many questions, you know. <laughs> there were too many questions. Yeah. Yeah. And is, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to give you six. Yes. And I'm going to give you six. Thank you. Numbers for yes. Oh, thank you. Numbers <laughs> ranking. <laughs>
pure and quick and clean. Yeah. 